Robert Friedland is a man not just with a past in mining, but a man with a keen eye on the future of the industry. He believes it's the next wave of technology that will drive the demand for raw materials. It's very simple. We have to intuit uh, the problems of the world and how we want the world to change and how technology has to evolve to get us there. As an example, in a world full of electric vehicles, there will be a higher demand for copper. And Robert Friedland has shown he is willing to go to the ends of the earth to find it. We really have to look at this little planet as our hunting ground because the greatest mine could be anywhere. Our travels have taken us to well over 50 countries around the world looking for the best. He's just got a genius for recognizing things that other, other people might not. He sees around corners a little bit. And he take, when he gets an opportunity, he will take full advantage of it. Although his degree from Reed College in Portland, Oregon was in political science, Robert's quest for the best started with trees, not minerals. His first business venture was investing in timberland with partner, college pal, Steve Jobs. We thought trees grow six or seven percent a year, naturally and uh, that would be a very good inflation hedge. It turned out to be true. On one of the timber blocks was an old mine that piqued Robert's interest in mining. In the early 80s, he bought an old silver producer, the Deer Trail Mine in Utah, and sold it to a Canadian stock promoter. To me, at that time, at a young age, to realize that the stock markets could value a tired old mine like that in the ground so highly was quite a, a revelation. And that's actually what started it. There's a few people around that, that, that are serial mine finders, and Robert is one of those. Robert has spearheaded either the discovery, the funding, or building of many major mining projects. One of the first game-changing discoveries, described by some as the find of the century, was a nickel-copper-cobalt deposit at Boise's Bay, Labrador. It was found by two prospectors originally contracted to look for diamonds and base metals by Diamond Fields Resources, a company Robert co-founded. They were flying back to their home camp at the uh, town of Nain one afternoon and uh, not having found any diamonds, they saw an interesting rock outcrop. They decided to come back the next day, landed their helicopter on it, and uh, it turned out to be uh, a major copper nickel discovery in, in the long run. Tech Resources made a deal for 11% of the company. Norman says it wasn't long before the major nickel players got involved. I think he had both Inkle and Falkenbridge, thinking he knew more than they did about it, and he certainly had them jumping uh, over hoops to try to outdo each other. Inco purchased the Boise's Bay project for $4.5 billion in 1996. The mine has become the lowest cost nickel producer in the world. In 2006, Valet acquired Inco and built a $4 billion process plant at Long Harbor, Newfoundland to produce 50,000 tons of nickel metal per year from Boise's Bay. Between 1996 and 2012, as executive chairman, president, and CEO of Ivanhoe Mines, Robert oversaw subsidiary projects in Australia, China, Myanmar, South Korea, and Fiji. He also set his sights on Mongolia. If you want to find an Easter egg, you can't keep looking where your older brother or sister already looked. You've got to find someplace new. So Mongolia is one of the last great places that had never been explored with modern science. It took tenacity on his part and faith in a great exploration team to make a major discovery on the Oyotogoi property BHP had given up on. They found a lot of smoke. They never really discovered the source of the fire. That takes a lot of intestinal fortitude. We nearly went bankrupt doing it. That ore body was discovered on hole number 151. That means that we drilled 150 holes, each of which was a failure. And then two years later, I think the 271st hole really and truly turned it into the world-class project it's going to be for the next hundred years. In 2012, Rio Tinto acquired Ivanhoe Mines, renaming it Turquoise Hill Resources. Oyutolgoi is now one of the largest copper and gold mines in the world, producing approximately 200,000 tons of copper and 700,000 ounces of gold each year with more to come from a huge underground mine 
being developed. I think he's demonstrated exploration uh, pays off and uh, he's uh, been able to, through his own dogged behavior, but also through the people that he's hired, demonstrate excellence in that area. Even though he's not a geologist, he's as good as any geologist out there in terms of his knowledge of geology and understanding what it takes. Robert continued his faith in the drill bit in Africa with the launch of Ivan Platts in 1998 to pursue mineral projects in sub-Saharan Africa. Ivan Platts later became Ivanhoe Mines. Robert and his team decided to look beyond the areas most companies explored. So there are a series of these mines, like pearls on a string, the copper belt. And the copper belt just ended under a blanket of sand that had blown in from the Kalahari Desert. And we thought, hidden underneath that sand, it would be logical to assume that those pearls on a string would continue. They were right. Kamoa is the first major discovery in the Central African Copper Belt in 100 years and based on resource estimates is the largest undeveloped copper deposit in the world. Robert is credited with creating business links throughout Asia and the Asia Pacific region for the past 25 years. He has been a resident of Singapore during that period where the family-owned Ivanhoe Capital Corporation is based. Robert has raised more than $10 billion on world capital markets for affiliated companies since 1993. Tony says Robert is willing to invest personally in his projects. He puts his money on the table and uh, he is personally invested in terms of being involved in all facets of, uh, of the business. So it just demonstrates the commitment that he has to uh, the companies and the industry. Robert also uses his success to give back. His resource projects provide community support programs and public health initiatives funded through the Friedland Foundation. He's been a great ambassador for the Canadian mining industry and I think we're very fortunate that mining was his chosen profession in terms of what he focused on. The mining industry will always be here. No matter what we do, we're going to rely on certain raw materials. As long as there is mining, you can be certain Robert Friedland will be searching the planet one step ahead of the technology that demands those raw materials.